All right, so uh, thank you for attending our doTERRA event. Um, as we go along, please post any questions you have in the chat. Uh, most of those will get to at the end for the Q&A, um, but as you think of them, go ahead and post those and we will get to those. So let me do a couple of introductions for Mike and Kelly. Um, so first, Kelly, he's currently the Director of Engineering, Manufacturing Facilities, and Maintenance Services at doTERRA. Previously was the External Relations and Senior Projects Manager in the Mechanical Engineering Department at BYU for four years. The majority of his career has been spent in the semiconductor industry with specialization in contract manufacturing and foundry man management process integration, process development, lean manufacturing, process monitoring, process <laughs> improvement, lots of things, yield improvement and account management customer service. His experience as both a manager of engineering teams as an individual contributor. And then Mike, um, <clears throat> He is the Senior Director of Global Manufacturing and Engineering and has been with doTERRA for over nine years. He has helped doTERRA's manufacturing efforts grow from an acquisition of a small contract manufacturer in 2012 to now having been the lead on the design and construction for two bottling plants in Pleasant Grove, totaling just over 300 square feet of space and another plant in Ireland of about 90,000 square feet. His experience at doTERRA has taken him to visit manufacturers on five different continents for doTERRA, establishing manufacturing relations in Brazil, China, Australia, to name some of the main areas, as well as visiting suppliers and partners in other countries. Mike has a degree from BYU in manufacturing engineering technology and is nearing completion of an executive MBA program. And a little bit about himself personally, him and his wife are the parents of five kids with three boys and twin girls. In his spare time, he spent he enjoys spending time with his family, both indoors and out, golfing, mountain biking, traveling, and eating delicious food. So we will turn the time over to Mike now. In the spare time that I do have, I should add that there's not a lot. Um, it says the host has disabled my ability to screen share. How yeah. rude. I know. <laughs> so while we figure out how I can share the presentation, Sarah's going to enable that feature. Um, yeah, Griffin, I work with Mason quite a bit. Um, Neil, Jeff Parkinson says hello from the old twin lab days. <laughs> You're on mute, but yeah, he's a good guy. Any, any luck there? Yeah, it's just then you need to. All right. <clears throat> Can you guys see my screen? <laughs> All right. So got a decent power, decently sized PowerPoint here. Uh, the first slide we'll go through is actually just a video that we will watch, kind of explaining a little bit about DoTerra, and uh, then I'll get into some more of the content. <laughs> Welcome to the global headquarters for doTERRA, the world leader in essential oils and essential oil infused products. We are excited to be with you and to share a bit with you about this beautiful campus. In March of 2013, we broke ground here in Pleasant Grove, Utah. 
The initial phase of campus, which included three office buildings, the arrival center, the product center, and the manufacturing facility, was later completed in July of 2014. We were excited to be together in the same place after previously being spread across multiple rented locations. Even before we were fully moved in, we recognized the need for more space. So we built an additional office building, which included an auditorium for large meetings and plenty of space for a quickly expanding member services team. But the growing didn't stop there. We for a quickly expanding member services team. But the growing didn't stop there. We soon added another office building and our employees were excited to learn that this new building would have its very own child care center. We also constructed the building where Prime Meridian Healthcare is located and we expanded our max. All right, we're gonna do a little uh, call an audible here and try to find a way to share this video that doesn't uh, slow down so much. I don't know what's going on, especially because it is pulling directly from my computer. So I don't know why it would um, have those buffering issues, but we'll move on. All right, so in the spring of 2008, uh, business and healthcare professionals joined together to create what would become the world's leading essential oil company. So we just celebrated our 13 year anniversary last month. Um, these are our, our executive team, our founders. So they come from various backgrounds, um, mostly involving companies here in the Valley, but also some out of state. Um, they are still involved in the day-to-day. -day. They are in the office every week, uh, traveling the world pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID to engage our operations and sales offices around the world. Um, our mission is, so it says here, over the years, we've watched doTERRA become a vehicle for many individuals to truly impact friends, family, and in some cases, entire communities. As we share our pure and potent essential oils, people's lives are blessed. While we have many worthy causes at doTERRA, this is our mission and it is being accomplished one person at a time. So some of our significant milestones since our founding. So 2008, as I mentioned, we were founded. 2011, we created a scientific advisory board. 2012, acquired our 100,000th customer. Two years later, we surpassed 1 million customers. 2015, we hired our 1,000th corporate employee. 2015 was our first $1 billion in revenue year. Uh, in 2016, we completed the manufacturing facility. In 2000, actually it was in 2015. In 2017, our corporate employee base reached 2,000. 2018, we achieved 2 billion in annual revenue. 2019, we opened our on-site employee medical clinic. In 2019, we got closer. It ended up into 2020 that we finished the completion of a 270,000 square foot distribution center, which is just on the other side of I-15 in Linden. And 2019, uh, we've surpassed 8 million customers in 70 plus countries around the world. Our geographical reach, which is something really neat to, to see and understand with our with BYU Management Society and the presence around the world. So we have customers in over 70 countries. We have 22 open and registered markets, and we have offices in 19 countries. Um, Chet asked an interesting stat about our kind of our top growth areas, our top selling markets. 
So in order, the US by its own is the US and Canada is our largest market, followed closely by China, um, EMEA, which does include Russia, uh, Latin America, Brazil combined, and then uh, North Asia. So we have Asia broken up into North and South. From a business perspective, uh, for those that are familiar with the direct selling industry, we actually refused the offer to join the National Association of Direct Selling Companies. We've taken strides to join in the healthcare industry. We actually have clinical trials going on for different products that we have. And we present that information typically on an annual basis at our global convention that's in the fall. Um, Pre-COVID, we would get 30,000 plus people in Salt Lake City and spread out between the what is it, the Vivint Smart Home Arena. To me, it's always the Delta Center. Uh, between the Salt Palace and the arena, we would spread out our convention. Um, a really unique factor for doTERRA and its relationship to the typical, what's, you know, multi-level marketing or direct selling world as is that 80% and even higher than 80% of our distributors, or as we call them, wellness advocates, have no interest in building a business. They simply sign up uh, for an annual wholesale membership like you would to a big box store like a Costco or a Sam's Club. Um, globally, we source oils directly from 45 different countries around the world. Um, we are at the source with over 95% of those. So we've taken great strides through our co-impact sourcing model, which we'll talk about a little bit later to eliminate where possible the middlemen, the brokers and go directly to the source. And so we, we, are on, we are on site. We have about 15 or so individuals that work for our sourcing team that are located around the world, managing those relationships and working with those different partners. So co-impact sourcing, as I stated earlier, so we have, we really wanna make a positive impact to the farmer, the harvester, the distiller to contribute to getting us the essential oils. Um, over half of the countries we get our oils from would be considered developing countries. And so to ensure that these farmers and harvesters are treated ethically, we introduced this initiative called co-impact sourcing. Um, since co-impact sourcing was created, we've supported over 300,000 jobs over a million lives have been impacted because of those jobs. And you can see on the bottom of the, the slide here that our main principles are to generate jobs, provide fair and on-time payments, build our capacity, sustain long-term partnerships, ensure fair labor conditions, promote cooperatives, ensure environmental stewardship, and facilitate community development. So they're actually in partnership with the Co-Impact Sourcing and our Healing Hands Foundation we have gone around the world and done disaster relief. We have built um, schools, clinics, various things. So this has, and we'll share the slide deck after. So it's okay probably if I skip a couple things here, but the mission of Healing Hands is to help people be financially responsible. We match projects, we impact different countries, efforts related to disaster relief, anti-human trafficking, clean water, empowering women. We have a really neat foundation we partner with called Days for Girls, and we actually create um, female hygiene kits that are shared with developing countries where there's a lot less education around that type of hygienic need that women have. And so we're really partnering with those companies to try to educate and support these women around the world. Um, like I mentioned earlier, so campus expansion, we, we built our first building in 2014 and grew from, from the initial phase. We've now completed all of our construction in, in uh, the state of Utah. We do have uh, no more plans right now of construction as we have obviously had to rebalance our, our work structure with more of a work from home presence due to COVID. We've seen great benefits of doing that with our, especially with our member services uh, call center teams. Um, but we do have still expansion plans. You can see in this top right corner, anything that's yellow are buildings that still could be built on our campus. Uh, there's actually probably more as we've purchased more land around. 
but we have you know the six or seven buildings now with it with the ability to build another six or seven more if we needed um health care so healthcare is a system that we we believe is, is quite broken especially the united states healthcare system and so what we're trying to do is they're trying to take a kind of a uh collaborative approach to the more traditional Western medicine, including essential oils and wellness to, to prevent, to use that with other more modern medical systems. And so we have our own prime meridian healthcare clinic. That's an employee clinic and now opening up to the public more and more. And if you go into that clinic, yes, you will be, you know, encouraged where it makes sense to utilize the products, you know, essential oils and different things but you also can go into the clinic and get an x-ray if you broke your arm or different things. So it's, it's definitely a, a balanced approach. They've got physical therapy in there now too. And, and so it's a really neat effort to try to tie both worlds together, which we think is huge in the healthcare space. Um, our manufacturing growth, just some, some highlights here. So we have, um, this is a, a 2020 based stat. So our average essential oil bottles filled per day was just under 400,000 bottles. Um, last year as a whole, we produced uh, 95 million bottles just here in our Pleasant Grove facilities. Our operation in Ireland has been operational since uh, the very end of October of last year. And they've produced almost 4 million bottles there. We'll probably produce close to 12 to 15 million bottles by the end of this year as they continue to grow and, and expand to be able to support the region out there. Um, corporate employees, so we have over 4,000 total employees, 3,200 in the US and another thousand outside of the US. We do a lot of, we did a lot of free meals through our doTERRA cafe to employees that needed to be working on site at the beginning of the pandemic. So that would be considered more for our um, manufacturing employees, supporting manufacturing functions, um, call center, different elements that could not work from home. We did a, a free lunch every day for those. Um, we also had uh, initiated during the pandemic, the first few months of it, we did a premium pay. So any employee that also just had to be on site, we also paid them a higher wage because um, we did put them in a slightly more risky scenario, considering some of the guidelines that were ever evolving at the beginning. And then we did give a lot of sick leave. Um, employees that were either a, they themselves or a family member were affected by COVID-19 and they had to stay home during their quarantine periods. They did not miss their pay. Even if they were out of their paid time off or their own sick time, we wanted to make sure that they were not impacted financially. So that was a a great effort done by the, the owners of the company. And then we did pay quite a bit more for extra staff to walk around. We frequently sanitized all the door handles to the break rooms, the offices. We cleaned up a lot more regularly than normal um, just to try to prevent any spread of COVID on campus. Um, so the, the motive behind our employment, which I know is a big factor in this discussion, talking about what we strive for employees to have and be a part of, is we want our employees to feel empowered in their career by providing a professional, positive, service-oriented, and family-friendly work environment. We strongly believe in helping each employee reach their potential by promoting career development and movement within the company. We want to empower our employees to share innovative ideas, develop valued personal relationships, and thoroughly love their jobs. In keeping with our mission of sharing and education, our corporate culture is one of service, collaboration, and commitment to doTERRA's high quality standard. We believe that each employee's effort contributes directly to our growth and success. A fun thing that just actually took place is we just had a survey conducted for all employees. I think we had about a 90% roughly, um, uh, response rate and had a very broad reach of questions related to employee satisfaction, whether it be pay or benefits or work environment um, and different things. And that just was presented two weeks ago, I believe, by our CEO, Dave Sterling, to kind of talk about some goals for the company. So they are working to evolve our brand, if you will, of employees. Um, what kind of people do we hire? Most talented and knowledgeable individuals for our teams, from research scientists to designers, we look for and bring on people who want to make their mark. 
We continue to grow. We are currently a $2 billion health and wellness organization. We remain debt free and we've never performed company wide layoffs. Not only is this a position, not only is a position with us full of opportunity, it's also incredibly secure. A career with doTERRA earns a paycheck, yes, but it also contributes to a larger mission. The work you do with doTERRA makes a difference on a global scale, impacting people around the world. So some of the types of positions that we, we hire here at doTERRA, so anything ranging from accounting and finance to customer service, human resources, IT, legal, manufacturing, marketing, operations, Prime Meridian. Within the operations group, you could look at the whole gamut of the supply chain from source to finished good bottle. We've got engineering, we've got logistics, we've got lots of different positions. The operations group is um, a little over 600, I think, six or 700 employees in that group. How to apply. So we have jobs.doterra.com, which is uh, the probably the easiest place. You can look for open positions, but we also utilize Indeed and LinkedIn to post positions. Um, our hiring process. So we, we kind of go through this, you know, we post the job, have a recruiting screen, a manager screen. We have interviews, extend an offer. And then there's some onboarding steps some paperwork to fill out. You are hired. And then there's a hiring manager intake session. So every, I believe it's every Monday, there's a good few hours spent for onboarding new employees. It includes a tour of the campus and which we'll walk through a little bit of what is seen in that. So lastly, some of the perks and benefits for working here. So we do have a doTERRA cafe of the which Sarah and I are enjoying lunch from right now. Um, it's, a, it's a good fresh take on some different ideas. They have sandwiches, salads, pizzas, smoothies. Um, it's subsidized 30%. So the employees get a discount. Um, it's a great benefit to not have to you know leave campus, drive somewhere and get lunch. You can easily grab a grab a treat there and bring it back to your office or eat over there. It's a great place. Uh, we have a gym we call a little fitness center. So you, you can see the picture here. We've got weights and machines, treadmills. It's got lockers and showers. So employees can go before or after or even during work for their lunch break if they want and go work out. Um, we have some fun, uh, we call it Go Terra. It's kind of the wellness arm of our HR group. So we have May Madness, which is just just ending um, so people can sign up for different competitions whether it be spike ball basketball bocce pickleball different things this picture right here of the basketball team that was taken just last week those are three of our engineers they actually won the three-on-three -three basketball tournament so they represent company-wide winners um, so two of those guys they are manufacturing engineers and then one is a chemical engineer and they work on different projects in within kelly's group we also do a Healing Hands Fun Run. So we have a, employees and their families can participate in a little 5K that goes around the campus here. It's a really neat uh, get together there. And then there's different events that take place. There's an annual golf tournament. Uh, Pre-COVID, we would have done, uh, there's a summer party where we, they rent out in one of the Megaplex locations and you can bring your family and get treats and all sorts of fun there. We do Easter egg hunts, we do food truck rallies. Obviously, all of this has changed drastically with COVID, um, but we hope that next year it can return to more of a normal state than it was before. And that's it. That is doTERRA, or part of doTERRA. That's the video. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know how we'll get that video figured out, but we'll try to get it out to everybody in the presentation after. I'm going to send an email after the event uh, with the recording and I'll include that video uh, that the technology didn't want to play <laughs> and um, also their slides. So we'll send that out. Um, we want to begin our, our Q&A session. So I've gotten a couple questions. We'll go ahead with that, but please put any questions you have in the chat either to everybody or direct to me and we can get those answered. So. Um, our first question is, why did doTERRA refuse the offer to join the multi-level marketing organization? 
Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question that probably has a lot of depth to it. Um, but the high the high level need there, I guess, is the direct selling association from the viewpoint that the owners had did not align as well with our, our goals and our mission. And so we chose to operate independent of that and stick, stay away from maybe some of the other companies that were in that association that we didn't want to be associated with, possibly. Um, it's actually a really old decision, but one that we're, I guess we, we, we talk about often, so I should have a better answer, but that's as best as I know. Yeah, that's great. Um, were there any manufacturing or uh, product fulfilling issues due to COVID-19? We just had to do a lot more of it. Um, <laughs> we actually saw a lot of COVID sales spikes around the world. As a lot of people like to treat any conditions or issues naturally as if they can. So I don't know, Kelly, we had a really crazy year last year. We tried to do more than we've ever done. We brought people in. I think we even ran Saturdays for a long time. It was, it was very crazy. Yeah. There, it was a real challenge to balance out. Uh, Mike mentioned or showed a slide talking about the, the uh, COVID benefits that were paid out. But, you know, at, at any time in my group, there would be one or two people missing either because they had COVID or because somebody was affected by COVID. Um, and, and we took a lot of precautions. If there was any hint that you might have COVID or be, have been exposed to COVID, you were asked to stay home. So there was quite an impact on that coupled with that with the uh, increasing sales demand and also trying to bring some new equipment on that we hadn't considered until that time it was a very exciting year uh, earlier Sarah asked me if how many days I worked at home during COVID and the answer was zero I was here the whole time because that's what we did it was a lot of fun I was actually happy to be here quite honestly as a follow-up to that um, what of your which of your products increased due to COVID specifically? Do you know any? So we have a group of products called OnGuard. It's seen as a fairly good um, sanitizer. We actually have a, we actually have an OnGuard sanitizing mist that has a 62% ethyl alcohol in it. So it's an actual OTC sanitizer that sold like crazy. And other products in that same family were some of the bigger ones. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. Next question, how much of the engineering department is R&D versus manufacturing and process management? <clears throat> don't. Yeah. So we don't have any engineers specifically assigned to R&D, but I would say they all participate in R&D to some extent. And I'd say it's probably 25% of their work is probably R&D type activities versus the rest are manufacturing. Okay. What process do you use to determine new products? <laughs> so we, we have a new product development process that starts out at ideation first, and then it goes through a series of, you know, business checking to make sure that it's a good business to be in, uh, that type of thing. Sourcing becomes involved because it may be a great idea, but there's no oil available or something like that. So it, it goes through that loop and then eventually it gets kicked out to the more functional teams like um, uh, manufacturing, if that's an, uh, a problem, procurement. <laughs> One of the engineering groups that I have is, is a uh, package engineering test group. And so maybe there's a new package that we have to look at, a new pump, uh, something like that, something that might have some interaction with uh, chemicals. So we'll have a 12 week test to put those new products through. So. That's kind of the way it goes. It's about a, a 18 month, 12 to 18 month cycle that starts out with the ideation, the business vetting, and then eventually comes down to procurement and uh, capacity. Okay, so how do you determine new geographical areas to expand into? Kind of tell us a little bit more about the co-impact sourcing and kind of how you decide to go into certain countries or areas and um, how you find the, the best people to um, source that for you. Yeah, so we have, just like Kelly mentioned, there's a new product development group. There's also a new market development group. 
Um, and so they, from various means, a lot of it because our business can grow word of mouth as it starts to get popular. So we have an opportunity that a customer in a country where we don't operate yet can order product in a status called NFR, which is not for resale. So they can order it from the US and it can ship directly to them and we can track that. And as we start to see sales grow in that region, we can see that there's an opportunity there. So then the new market development team, part of that uh, effort they will take is go kind of investigate and, and discuss further on that next market. And then they involve the regulatory team. They involve, you know, the tax and different areas of the company to evaluate what could happen in that region. And oftentimes if it's, let's use an example like, um, I don't know, Thailand. So customers in Thailand could have been ordering products from, from Korea, Japan, from China, from different areas nearby. But then Thailand now gets its own office and they've been, they're opening the Thailand office because of the growth in Thailand. So they kind of base it off of what they see happening in those countries. And then there's a whole effort and they have a whole giant checklist of things they look through to be able to operate in that market. Um, we probably opened two to four markets a year, which is very aggressive. And so it's slowed down a little bit. It's still one to three though. And really in the end, it's probably still three to five because we don't want to say no to sales, right? And yeah. so we, we definitely push and open that. Yeah. So which countries are easiest to get into and which countries do you have a hard time getting into for sourcing? Um, so from an oil sourcing perspective, um, it, it gets kind of tricky depending where you go. One of the probably most difficult ones yet we've navigated well is we've actually gotten uh, some co-impact sourcing opportunities and have built clinics in Somaliland. So that's a very difficult part of the world to operate in. The sourcing manager who is over that region is a, a former military. I believe he was a Green Beret and has a lot of good experience, is very comfortable sleeping on top of a Jeep in some remote canyon in Somaliland so that he's not known to be where he is. Um, that, that's how crazy the stories have gotten to the, the elements of, you know, Somaliland, which is more difficult to be in, to, you know, sourcing lime oil from Mexico, for example, could be a lot easier. So it just depends. Um, sourcing, what they will drive a lot of their regional focus will be, is based on the need. So if we have a certain oil that we get now, and we project out that we're going to need double that amount of oil, but the place they get it from can't support that, then they'll branch out and find other sources for that same oil, same species, same everything. So that's kind of part of how they figure out where to grow. Yeah, it's quite the process. Yeah. Okay, do you offer expat packages for employees who relocate outside of their home country? Yep, yep. Every, uh, in fact, I actually had an expat offer to go live in Ireland for two to three years as we set up that operation. I declined the offer as my wife was giving birth to twins and we did not want to take that uh, journey on in Ireland by ourselves with our other three kids and no family help. Um, but yeah, anybody that we, we ship out from here and I, I assume I've not been involved in, but people that have gone from other countries to other regions, there's always an expat um, contract. Awesome. I wouldn't blame you at all for not yeah. wanting to do that. It was hard enough with family nearby. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So kind of moving into some of the, uh, the hiring questions. Um, how many employees do you think you will hire in the United States during the next 12 months? So we looked at this a little bit to try to understand. It, it depends on the department. It depends on the area. So we're seeing a lot of our growth internationally uh, as compared to the U.S. The U.S. is still growing, but as a comparison to the international growth, it's, it's not the same. And so really what grows more in the U.S. now from an employee base is departments or groups that support the international growth. So our call center member services, they'll have a lot of growth. Um, our new market development, our regulatory our product development as they grow to expand. So I would think that when we looked at the next 12 months, 
there's, I, I'd say there's probably two different ways to look at hiring. There's replacement hiring, and then there's new positions, right? The replacement side, because a huge percentage of our manufacturing, logistics, and member services are college students, there's a lot of turnover that happens just annually. Like right now, this time of year, semester ends, and people just move. Either they go back home for the summer or they graduate and want to go work somewhere else. In fact, one of our engineers that's been here since he was a freshman in college as an intern, uh, he actually is moving this weekend to New Mexico for a job um, at a company down there. So I would say replacement wise, you know, based on the turnover and the attrition that happens, there's probably 50 to 100 positions every month that are getting replaced just because, I mean, the call center has almost 1,500 employees. And then within manufacturing and logistics, there's about 500 people. Um, as far as new positions and new growth, that number may be one to 200 over the next 12 months. I don't even know if it's that. Um, I'd say 50 to 100 positions in a, around the campus in the next 12 months wouldn't be hard to imagine. If you go outside of the US, I mean, that number is gonna grow even more. Yeah, how big is your HR department? <laughs> Uh, they, it's pretty big. They need to get bigger. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you mentioned some interns. Do you take interns in every area? You've had mentions of you know different areas that you have in DoTerra. Do you take interns in every area or only specific ones? So every area. Um, I will brag for a second. We have had an intern in our engineering group since probably 2013, maybe 2012. Awesome. So we've, we've really pushed for the engineering internship. Uh, we, we used to just stick with more of the manufacturing engineering technology department, but we branched to mechanical, to electrical, to chemical. chemical. Um, <laughs> we've had a couple chemical. Kelly's a chemical engineer by education. Um, but then there's a big push right now. We actually just hired a new campus recruiter which I had to clarify with HR means university campus recruiter, not hiring for our campus. That was very confusing to me. Um, Tammy, she just started in the last couple of months. I don't know if we've introduced you to her yet or if you met her, but you will. So she will work directly with, you know, the U, BYU, UVU for, for internships. But the goal is to have interns in all departments around the company. And they want to actually develop the program where they're in somewhat of a cohort. And so they may be in different departments, but they get together once every other week and kind of have lunch together for an hour and talk about their project and just kind of network as a group. I like that, so that's yeah. kind of the new project that's been getting yeah. more emphasis, I'd say. Yeah. I have uh, talked to Tammy through email okay. and she couldn't attend this event because she had a prior engagement, but she will watch this. So hi, Tammy. <laughs> and um, go, we'll Tammy. be in contact. <laughs> yeah. um, so tell us a little bit more about your internship program. Is it only for a semester? Is it for a year? Uh, like, what do you require students to do, like one-on-ones, or tell us what that looks like? Yeah, so I can I can answer that from the engineering standpoint at least. Um, like Mike said, we had an intern that was here for seven years. Uh, seven years? No, probably. I did hire him when he yeah. was a senior in high school. So. <laughs> yeah, so he was actually a senior in high school. So um, that's kind of a unique situation we won't get into. But anyway, we usually have an intern uh, that's open-ended quite honestly the intern can do a, a summer internship that I we had an electrical engineer last year from uh, BYU Idaho that was here just for the summer or they can extend it through uh, fall and winter semesters if they want to if they can keep working going to school we're happy to have them because we don't have to retrain somebody uh, we put them into I mean in the engineering department I think that's true with other departments that I've seen like sourcing or planning our interns do real work. I mean, we pretty much fill a, a, a need with them that's a real job. We don't have them doing menial stuff by any means. They're doing the real work and <clears throat> really valuable work to us. And so that's a that's kind of a unique thing, I think, for doTERRA that we don't have them doing, I don't know, making coffee or whatever the traditional intern joke is out there. Making root beer. <clears throat> making root beer, yeah, <laughs> sorry. We got of the audience. You know, you know your audience, <laughs> Kelly. You know your audience. <clears throat> but um, it's, it's quite variable. We, we uh, have a review with them once a year, maybe twice a year. We'll call in the operations uh, management team and the uh, interns will present to the management team what their project was, uh, any feedback on the intern process. 
we're, we're wanting to make it a good experience. And I'd, I'd finish off by probably the majority, uh, uh, by quite a bit of the engineering uh, staff started out as interns. So we really look at our internships to hire. And that's pretty common, I know, out in the industry. Yeah, that was kind of my next question is, yeah. you know, what kind of percentage goes mm -hmm. from interns to a full time? I'd say in engineering is probably high 70s. That's awesome. Know, um, not not all of them, because we have sometimes we have a lot of interns, but not enough positions to, to fill. But it's pretty high. Yeah. You know, I yeah. don't know about the other departments. Yeah, I don't think it's as high. Yeah. But I would say that it's still forty well, percent, mm -hmm. and it is your ultimate goal because you're not retraining them, right? It, in essence, <laughs> becomes our hiring pool. Right. They already know us. We know them, because we we do typically, um, and we've learned over the years how to navigate this a little better. But a lot of an in, a lot of an internship had started as a summer internship, and depending how the summer went, both are you a good fit for us, and are we a good fit for you? Then it could extend into the fall semester, the winter semester, and so on. And so there have been some that weren't great fits either way. And so they, we've, we've parted ways or they've parted ways with us. But the goal is, yeah, to keep them on as long as they want them. And then if there, if there is a position upon graduation, we want to keep them for yeah, sure. For sure. And as, coming from a university perspective, like that's something that we tell our students, you know, a lot of employers will, you know, keep people for a little bit. And then as long as the fit's good, then they do like to hire them. So that's good to hear. Um, also, we appreciate doing real work because the whole making, getting root beer, that whole thing <laughs> is real. And, you know, especially for academic credit, you know, we have to have students doing real stuff. Correct. So that's always a good, uh, a good thing to have and good mentors mm -hmm. know what they're doing. Um, okay, next question. Um, what types of matching projects does doTERRA do? I think it was on your slide. Oh, probably for the Healing Hands Foundation. Yeah. I think that, so they've done different things. They've done like micro lending programs, but they've also done, I, I believe the matching is related to some of the government work that's taking place. So we'll partner with a prefecture in Japan, for example, and they want to match. We'll meet them in the middle. If the project was $10,000, we'll contribute five and they'll contribute five. I think that's what that means. The matching program. Hands. I didn't understand that, but that's my okay. understanding. Yeah, the that. matching program actually. We always, there's a lot of push to have, to help people, but to have them have some skin in the game. So matching okay. is a lot of what happens in that way. So that they also have investment in it, not just we just give them. Some Absolutely, money. yeah, yeah. Hey, Mike, can you guys um, give me Yeah, point? I know you talked a little bit about the medical clinic that you guys, you guys have, and it's kind uh, of like a, a new concept to me, at least. So. If you guys can tell us a little bit more about that, you know, what's the feedback that you're getting from employees and the in the small public that you've done? Um, Are there Sarah, Sarah but before we go to the next one, I think Kevin had a comment on the last one. Um, yeah, so the, the feedback, so initially from an employee perspective, I think the feedback is fairly positive, A, because it's right here on site, and B, it's free. So there's no co-pays, there's no um, not as high a fees as if you were to go to your primary care physician and um, and it still runs through insurance and all that yeah, could, yeah. Could, so I actually have my insurance through them hmm. um, I don't have a doctor outside of the doTERRA clinic um, my, co my insurance premium is five dollars a month so it's practically nothing um, and, you know, I drop in there to do things like, uh, well, I tore a muscle, you know, so I go get it looked at, evaluated, physical therapy, x-rays, I've done all that stuff there. Um, it, it's, it's a great thing. I, I, I think that, uh, like Mike said, it's a real blend of holistic medicine that uh, a large part of the world is more comfortable with, coupled with Western medicine, which we are typically uh, comfortable with. And, um, I think it's just a great thing. I'm a huge advocate of it. Kevin, what impact or what points would you make on that note? To no, I, I was actually going to comment a couple questions back. <laughs> so um, one of the things you talked about was the matching program. The matching program is really driven by 
uh, our wellness advocates come to Healing Hands with a project that they want us to sponsor or to support. And uh, we set a certain base. Uh, so if they're doing, it could be a community project, it could be a global project. It could just really, they, uh, the goal of Healing Hands is to help as many as possible. So the wellness advocates will come to us with, uh, they want to build a, you know, a park in a local community or they want to support a local charity or they want to, you know, do some larger projects around the world or even, and so they will set a budget. So there, maybe their goal is $10,000 that they want to raise through um, our, through um, their own efforts. If they reach that $10,000 or what, you know, whatever they reach in terms of their own campaign fundraising, we will match that in order them, in order for them to do that, uh, complete that project. That's, that's the Healing Hands project uh, matching program. I think that's what you were referring to in your, in your slide deck. Um, I apologize, I wasn't commenting about the question two questions in advance. So just wanted to make sure you guys were clear on that. So yeah, thanks, Kevin. Some technical difficulties on our end. Are you muted? Um, okay, so you mentioned that there's a, there's a medical clinic in Pleasant Grove and there's one in St. George. And then what are your other expansions planned uh, for those locations? Kevin, do you know anything about that? Because I'm not familiar. I think for now, the plan is to keep it to those two. I know there was a, a bigger, uh, when it was originally introduced, the clinics, we had actually a clinic in Nashville as well. So we were looking at a national expansion. But I think they're in the process of just really solidifying how it works here. So the clinic here at doTERRA at Pleasant Grove campus is actually, a, it's, it operates as a near site clinic for some employers. And it operates as a, a just a community-based clinic as well. So if you know, really, if you're interested in, in, in kind of that complementary blended Western medicine with acupuncture, or, you know, physical therapy, aromatherapy, all the different things that may complement healthcare, uh, that's that's what the, the health clinic is all about. Now you're, we have doctors and physicians, and we have nurses, and and so they're, they're they are trained in Western medicine. Uh, but we also, but we're also looking at ways that we can introduce complementary uh, care into the into the into the healthcare program. So, uh, really benefiting right now just the Utah, but also wellness advocates if they want to use it, they're also welcome. And uh, so the expansion plan is kind of gray right now. There's not a really, uh, it's not quite as wide open as uh, originally planned several years ago when we first introduced Prime Meridian. Uh, but it is open for general, you know, the general community, as well as near site employers. Oh, thank you. All right, keep submitting questions because I have one last question here. So submit a couple more. Uh, so what steps do you take to make sure customers understand the uses, but are more importantly, the limitations of essential oils to mitigate the oil mom stereotype and encourage balanced health care? Yeah, so that may be a Kevin answer as well, but I'll initially say that I know there is a, a there's an entire department that is focused on keeping the marketing materials and the educational opportunities for our customers to understand what the essential oils can do, should do, what can be talked about, what is scientifically supported, and different things. What else would you add to that, Kevin? Yeah, I think that's probably pretty clear. That's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's we certainly don't make any medical claims about essential oils or our products. Um, there's a lot more. I think one of the things that doTERRA takes pride in is the science behind essential oils. We, we are fully invested in the scientific studies of essential oils. We have many clinical studies going on right now. We have partners uh, with universities around the world, the National Center for uh, the National Center for uh, Natural Products Research out of Ole Miss is a, is a partner of ours. Uh, we do research at other healthcare institutions around the world. We get approached quite frequently by um, healthcare uh, medical facilities and hospitals around the world looking to figure out how to in implement uh, studies in their own facilities around aromatherapy and mood and how essential oils may play a role in, in, in treating or supporting patients during difficult treatments. And, um, and so there's a lot of opportunity for us to take this the, the medical and scientific 
research and we were fully invested in that to, to another level. Um, but um, the education is critical. It's the reason why we do a direct sales model. Uh, it's, it's taking the approach of how do you, um, you can certainly go to a Target or a TJ Maxx, for example, and buy a, uh, some essential oils, but do you understand what those are? Do you understand what's in them? We take the approach that, look, we're getting the oil from the source. It's why we go to such extremes to get the oils. It's why our oils don't cost $9.99 for a, a, a set of 10 oils because the process to get them is so extreme. And so for us, it's about take the one-on-one -on -one education that it takes to understand the oils, then also providing the, taking, to, taking the science and the, medic, and the medical aspects of it to another level and actually investing in the, both those. So that yes, you're gonna have the oil mom stereotypes. Certainly we understand that we have a, our, our base of customers is, a, is largely female, but, but don't take them on <laughs> in terms of, in terms of uh, um, you know what they believe and what they support, uh, we are. But we do want to fully back, um, fully help them understand what the limitations are. But at the same time, understanding that we're we're invested in helping and in, in helping the world understand the benefits of essential oils. Um, so I'll just I hope that makes makes some makes some sense into what we're our approach on education and healthcare. Yeah, that's perfect, thank you. Okay, so kind of going into the engineering and manufacturing specific stuff, how are the varieties of roles broken down in the department? Do engineers own specific oils or steps, specific pieces of equipment? Mm -hmm. How does that work? So the group is divided, I'd say three ways and easily stated. We have a uh, group that does packaging engineering. There's uh, two engineers and an intern that work in that group. And they're primarily looking at uh, new packaging options, uh, you know, chemical interactions with those packages, that type of thing. Uh, then there's a group that is primarily focused on the manufacturing side of things. So uh, we do things all the way from really distillation of the oils. We have some interaction there uh, through uh, refinement, we call it, which is kind of cleaning up the oil a little bit blending where we take maybe two or three main oils and combine them together up to six or eight oils so those are our blends and then we bottle it so that you know uh, mike said we did 95 million bottles last year uh, you can imagine the equipment that we have to have is highly automated to do that so we have uh, engineers in those those areas so um third area would be um, i'd say documentation compliance uh, things like that, because we work with groups like the FDA, um, NSF, we have to have compliance. And so we uh, have certain uh, regulations that we have to follow. So we have engineers looking after that. So I'd say those are the, probably the three groups that we uh, are, are kind of divided into. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the internal growth potential, both upward and lateral? And is doTERRA top heavy in terms of management opportunities? <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. Yeah. Where's Where's HR when you need them? They can answer that question better. Yeah. I heard that Mike can answer any question. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, I'll add the growth from the growth standpoint for DoTerra. Um, there's an independent organization called Verify Markets um, that did a, a study last uh, year, and they found that the, the global aromatherapy and essential oils market is about 7.7 .7 billion in 2019. Uh, and that is expected to grow uh, to 18.6 billion by 2026. Um, so that's uh, so we feel like this is uh, still uh, a relatively young market with a lot of opportunity to grow. I don't know if that is that was that the is that specific growth question? Yeah, I mean you guys got your work cut out for you. <laughs> yeah, I would say to add to Kevin's point as it relates to growth within the company. So, and, and, and apologies, we can mostly just speak to our specific department more intimately, but to give you an example, our, our engineering manager, uh, he's been with us seven years, probably mm -hmm. so now, mm -hmm. he was an intern and he graduated and we hired him and then he got interns under him and then the team grew and now he manages the group. So there's definitely some growth opportunities. Um, as far as lateral, I mean, there are people that switch departments all the time. Yeah, there's they, a lot of opportunities. 
it moves, the people move around, try new things out, go from our call center to our marketing team to operations. We, we, there's a lot of lateral movement. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, for someone that's wanting to just like get into doTERRA, you know, they don't have connections or anything like that. Like what's a tip that you could give them? Uh, what's going to make them stand out um, to, to get a position since it is pretty competitive? Intern wise or full time? Either. Yeah. I'd say intern wise, it would be a great connection with Tammy, who's our new recruiter for the engineering or the intern program for the whole company. As for full time positions, I would say, you know, obviously the LinkedIn and Indeed resources are good. Um, checking the doTERRA dot, or jobs.doTERRA.com, as mentioned previously. Um, LinkedIn, you can find us, you can find others that work here that connect and can you know try to connect you we're we're a very i would say we have a really good system of openness where we'll get asked at times or we'll ask other people to interview somebody that we don't even know we'll say hey this is so and so from my neighborhood their son just graduated would you mind interviewing them we're like yeah bring them in like even if we don't have open positions we still let people say hey come in let's meet and just kind of begin that networking. I think we do that quite a bit. We do a lot of tours between Mike and I, just people that are interested in doTERRA and maybe want to work someday. Yeah. I mean, yeah. one a week probably, we're just walking people through. So. Okay. Very do you have open. any like specific events for people to come to? I know that you guys do come to career fairs. I don't think we do any job fairs. It's mostly just the career fairs and the internship opportunities or the bigger, broader outreach type yeah. things. Okay. Perfect. Okay, does anyone have any last questions? All right, thank you. Uh, just another thank you to Mike and Kelly and Kevin, we're throwing you in there too, um, for answering all of our questions and, and teaching us about doTERRA. Um, well, we're gonna have a quick closing prayer. Um, I will go ahead and offer that and then we will close. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to network and learn more about doTERRA and um, our other colleagues. And please bless that we can all be safe and that we can um, continue to learn more and do our jobs well. And um, we thank thee for um, everything that we're given. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.